All right, hello everyone. This is Jess Unger here. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. This is the fifth in your eight-part series to complement the in-person training for the Texas Heritage Responders team. These programs are made possible through the generous grant funding support of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. So today we will continue the discussion of some material-specific salvage tips. Uh, reminder that last week you learned about photograph and electronic media salvage. Today you'll learn about textile salvage, and then you'll see that next week we'll look at how to salvage wooden and upholstered furniture. Please refer to this slide as a reminder of all upcoming program dates. And if you miss any sessions, I will email you after the program with a link to the webinar recording. Simply email me when you have finished reviewing the program, and I'll mark your attendance on your file. Before we begin today's presentation, just a quick refresher of technical notes. On your screen, you'll see several boxes, including one labeled chat on the left-hand side. You can use that chat box to say hello, ask questions, and share any information or links that you'd like. If you post a question in the chat box, you'll re receive a response from me. And any questions will be noted, collected, and then I will verbally ask them of our presenter, Meg, during a break in the presentation. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a new feature called the Files box. This works in a similar way to the web links box that you've seen before. So simply click on the name of a file to highlight it in blue, and then click on the download file button to save a copy to your computer. Our presenter has very generously put together some excellent resources for today's topic. But a special note, please see the file labeled Do Not Share, Tips and Tricks to Remove the Mud from Textile Collections After a Flood. This is a publication that is typically a member benefit for those AIC members who are part of the textile specialty group. We receive special permission to share this file with you all as part of your coursework, but please do not distribute this document with those outside of this class. And with that, I'm very pleased to introduce you all to today's presenter, Margaret, or Meg, Geis Mooney. Meg has been providing a full range of services as a conservator, a collections care and collections management consultant since 1979. Meg is available for both short-term and long-term projects, on-site and off-site. She's completed undergraduate and graduate coursework at the University of California, Davis in textile science. During her academic career, Ms. Geis Mooney took courses that enabled her to fully understand textiles from the molecule up, so as to be able to most successfully preserve and conserve her textile and fiber heritage and legacy. She has worked on staff at the Cloisters Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and at the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco. She recently completed on-site treatment work at the National Museum of Cutter. Meg is a senior museum senior member of the American Association of Textile Chemists and Colorists, a professional associate of the American Institute for Conservation, has been a member of the National Heritage Responders, formerly known as AIC CERT, since 2011. She was appointed to the City of Petaluma Public Art Committee in March of 2015. Meg co-taught the AIC CERT slash Heritage Preservation Emergency Planning and Response Workshop on the West Coast in January 2012 and the Textile Costume Fiber Salvage section of the FAIC Disaster Training Webinar for the Miami Heritage Responders Group in August of 2017. And with that, I would like to turn things over to Meg for her presentation on textile salvage. Great. <clears throat> Let's see if it, is it, everybody can hear me, I hope. Thank you so much, Jeff. Yep, you it's sound a pleasure to... Good. Excellent. It's my pleasure to speak with you all today. I'm glad you are uh, getting involved in Heritage Response. It's a wonderful, uh, wonderful program. Um, I won't go in, uh, Jess has done a great uh, introduction for me. I've also got what I call my one-page blurb is also available in the EM files box. So if you have a touch of insomnia sometime, take a look at it. I also want to warn you uh, from a sonic standpoint that I'm speaking to you from a room that has several antique clocks in it that chime and ring the hour. So if all of a sudden you hear bonging or chiming going on, uh, hopefully it'll be in the background. It won't be too obnoxious. So we have a lot to cover today, this morning. So let's get started. One of the things that I mention uh, all the time is, of course, we have um, ideal versus reality. Uh, as you know, I have no need to explain that to you all, as you are living that every single day in your work at the museums. 
and Historical Society and this is Heritage Collection uh, Preservers. Uh, oh, another one of my favorite sayings is an ounce of prevention is a pound, worth a pound of cure. And so every step that you can take in the ounce of prevention department will save you a load of a uh, pound of cure in terms of the headache department. Um, and of course, because of my particular specialties, I always think that there's a fabric or fiber solution. And the, my uh, also uh, with you all in uh, the heritage collections area, uh, if it's not one thing, it's another. All right, so let's get started. So we are preserving in this, in our responsibilities, both as uh, heritage preservers and uh, as heritage responders, uh, preserving both the people and the objects and the artifacts. And the objects and the artifacts that I'm speaking about today are made from organics and inorganic media. And uh, my particular areas of expertise are objects and uh, artifacts that are made from organic. So things like textiles and costume and the upholstery part of upholstered furniture and basketry. And I want to point out that the thing that we need really to keep in mind here also is that people always come first. I It's hard sometimes in a disaster situation, but people's safety and health has to always come first. I, uh, If you haven't already got it on your bookshelves, uh, on the reference list that's uh, available down below, there's a fabulous book called Health and Safety for Museum Professionals that is a must-buy, I think, for every historical agency. So when I'm talking about textile and costume and fiber, basically textiles are sort of two-dimensional structurally. Uh, of course they're not. They're actually three, but they're flat. And then costume is mostly three-dimensional, and they're tailored in shape, multiple layers, a front and a back. And in cases of textile and costume, they usually have a function or a use. And this makes them sort of unique in collection uh, types versus paintings or um, uh, sculpture. Uh, they're usually used on by and on living creatures, and they range in size. It's just an incredible amount of complexity possible from a single layer to multiple layers of the different media. As conservator, uh, we also have to um, keep the actual condition in mind. It's very difficult to make hard and fast generalizations sometimes, and the weakest link or links must be kept in mind. And that's not always the textile and fiber component. The other thing I also want to stress is that um, there are always improvements and breakthroughs and ongoing uh, upgrading and replacing and learning from our experiences and our research and our mistakes. And so the recommendations that are mentioned today in terms of a particular process or a particular uh, chemical or whatever or procedure or treatment or whatever might change as we learn from our mistakes and or our research. So what are we battling here? As an overall, we're, these are the, in a short order here, the source of deterioration for objects and artifacts. And we'll touch on these lightly in a moment. And of course, disasters, whether large or small, are, have all of these things involved uh, in a short period of time. There is synergy among these sources of deterioration, and they overlap at times as well, especially during a disaster. And our job is we want to slow down the deterioration, realizing, of course, that we can't stop the deterioration. So just briefly, the disasters are the large amounts of these deteriorating factors 
concentrate in a short period of time. And of course, they can also range in size from literally just one storage box to all the way up to a region or whole state. And it invariably is a combination of the failure of building systems, you can see those there, combined being overwhelmed by the forces of nature. And in all of this, it's usually the dealing with water overwhelming our building systems uh, coming from forces of nature and the resulting contamination. So here's just some of the things about what inherent vice is, what it's made out of, how it's made, how it's used, how it's previously changed. I won't spend much time on this. Um, you can always come back and really dig into it again um, after the webinar is published. And also there's a couple of references on the, uh, the reference list at the bottom that will be uh, helpful to you in terms of talking about the different uh, inherent vice problems with natural fibers and man-made fibers and synthetic fibers. And so it's basically, you know, once again, just a summary of, you know, how the textiles and costume or basketry are made and how it was used and how it's been previously changed, both sympathetically and non-sympathetically. So in a disaster situation, here's a, a nice summary. Basically, the natural fibers, since they absorb and hold water easily, um, really suck up the water. And it's a, this then, of course, leads to other situations that uh, the mold and mildew uh, have, uh, can easily digest it. Uh, in the case of natural fibers and the man-made fibers, um, they are physically weaker when they're wet, even when they're uh, new. And of course, once they're aged, it's even uh, more of a problem. Uh, the good news about synthetic fibers is that they do not absorb or hold water easily, and so this and the strength is not affected when they're wet. Uh, the complication with synthetic fibers is they have a lower tolerance to heat and will melt at lower temperatures than will affect natural and man-made fibers. And then, of course, we have the other things that are involved in making textiles and costume. And they all have their own problems. If you have a cardboard stiffener, if you have uh, a metal that rusts, um, things like that. Also, when we come about talk about the technology involved, the dyes uh, uh, made before about the mid-1950s were not very dye fast. It, that means they bleed very easily. And or uh, because of the environmental and cultural restrictions, the, uh, they didn't have access to water to rinse out the excess unfixed dye molecules. And of course, those dye molecules don't really care which fiber molecule they interact with. And uh, so that is a, an ongoing problem when those dye molecules have been moved uh, by water to a different part of the costume or textile. Uh, we also have, as I mentioned, um, the mixed media with differing responses to heat, water, and then drying. Here's some of the problems in terms of fiber and media foibles uh, when they're used together. Here we have, let's see if I can get this, yeah, here we go. We have a bast fiber, very coarsely woven, that was used to stiffen this very lightweight silk fabric. And then, of course, it was exposed to water, and the tide lines have uh, occurred, and more tide lines here as well. And what's happened is a fragile silk uh, has has deteriorated much more quickly and fallen away from the the much more durable jute inner lining. So it's both a physical condition problem and a visual condition problem. 
And then the fabric construction foibles, you literally can have something that looks like it's uh, bleeding or shading, but basically it's the translucency of this white fabric allows the red fabric that's behind it or another layer of the white fabric, the seam allowance, to be a more denser color. And so that affects the visual condition. On the blue textile, we have a very coarsely woven fabric that is actually made out of rayon, and so it's also very slippery and very easily slipped away from the seam stitching and started unraveling. Of course, in a disaster situation, this is going to be uh, happen even faster, the unraveling part. So in physical and mechanical stress in a disaster situation, of course, physical and mechanical stress is due to gravity, uh, the flexing and folding, use of bias grain. And so uh, this additional stress um, is caused uh, by the weight of the water that's absorbed. And it's, water's really heavy, you know, it's eight, over eight pounds just for one gallon and the uh, natural absorbency of natural and man-made fibers is very easy for them to uh, absorb gallons and gallons of water. So um, you also have the reaction of these natural and man-made fibers. They physically swell as they absorb the moisture and physically shrink as the moisture, uh, vapor, and liquid water evaporates. I've already mentioned that the natural and man-made fibers are physically much weaker when wet and so will tear uh, and come apart much more easily when they're wet. And of course with costume we have a situation where we have, or other textiles too, with dangling parts and components that um, can have additional uh, fabric uh, physical and mechanical stress to the fabric and to the attachment points if they are not supported when they're being moved. And then we have the uh, mere uh, flexing and folding, increasing and scrunching and rolled up and flattened and piled on and whether something's folded to fit inside a box or if a uh, dress skirt fabric has been pleated to, into the waistband. Uh, we have fibers that break along the fold lines and the, the creases. So as the fibers deteriorate, which means the polymer chains are breaking and becoming shorter, the physical and mechanical stress has more effect, especially when they're damp and wet. And here's just a, an example of a, a costume on an inadequate hanger, and it is literally caused, has physical problems already without even being wet, it's literally tearing off the, the hanger. So you can just imagine if this thing gets soaked at the bottom of it and so is even heavier, it will even tear away even faster. And the dyes will probably be bleed too. Here we have a waistband. That, let's see if I can get this. Well, it seems like my arrow has stopped working. All right. Uh, um, Meg, if you just move your cursor, the arrow should follow it. Uh -huh. But if it's not oh, working, all then... All right, I'll try that. All right. Oh, there we go. All right. Right, you can see the teeny tiny little stitches here that was used to attach the silk fabric uh, to the waistband. You can also see that the silk fabric is tearing, that there's multiple different kinds of fabric. Uh, we have also, it's been pierced by a um, safety pin. And so just the physical mechanical stress of it being worn, including the inherent vice problems of all these tiny little stitches is uh, causing physical and visual condition problems. Light. Once again, here's just a summary of all the different things uh, caused by um, light. The ultraviolet portion is in the range of 300 to 400 nanometers. The visible range is in 380 to 700 nanometers. And then the infrared, which is 700 and above nanometers, 
and then uh, x-rays and microwave. X-rays are below UV and microwave is above IR. And, and so we can see, and I must point out that the that people forget that it's all wavelengths of light that cause damage, not just the ultraviolet portion, and that the exposure is a function of both the intensity and the duration. So that ounce of prevention pound of cure is we want the less intensity of light for shorter periods of time equals um, textiles and fibers and costume um, lasting in better physical and visual condition. So light in a disaster situation drops them in importance compared to the other sources of deterioration. There, um, you need enough light for personal safety and to assess the damage. If you're working outside during salvage operations, try to work in the shade, you know, rig up tarps, uh, et cetera, to provide um, shade a work in tents and canopies. So I'm sure you all have in your collections uh, situations of light exposure. Here we have a, a tassel here that looks like it's white, but upon ex further examination, you can see that actually that tassel is supposed to be light pink. It's an indication of um, the usual kind of dye fading that happens with the early aniline dyes. Irreversible, of course, and has obvious physical uh, and visual impact. High temperature and relative humidity. Here's just some of the uh, the summary of it. And the thing to remember here is, of course, is that the it gets back to basic chemistry, where the rate of reaction doubles in speed roughly for every 18 degrees Fahrenheit increase, and that the infrared part of light manifests as heat. So here, here with is some of this overlap I had mentioned previously. Also in terms of overlapping with other sources of, of deterioration uh, is the amount of water vapor in the air. Um, and so uh, this water vapor it can then be absorbed by the natural and man-made fibers and physically swell and get heavier because now they're uh, holding on to water molecules as well. And then, of course, we have the mold and mildew growth uh, occurring more easily. Dyes can bleed and run, metals reacting, and also the fibers can become brittle if they're too cold, they may lose their flexibility. So here's that overlap with physical and mechanical stress. So in a disaster situation, this is one of the most important ones uh, combined with contamination and physical mechanical stress. If uh, one of the salvage responses is to freeze, you must fully support the, um, the textiles and costume because they become extremely brittle. And you cannot unfold or manipulate them while they're still frozen because they literally crack apart. And the scale of the disaster can really impact um, this high temperature and relative humidity and whether or not you can do anything about it. So here's just some examples of um, different mold and mildew. Sort of the black one, then we have a white one. And then here we have um, different effects different kinds of safety pins that have corroded. And of course, we also have physical and mechanical stress for this one because it's actually uh, not out of the, the, the textile and trying to get this uh, corroded safety pin out of the textile without causing further damage is going to be a, a, a tricky job and in, usually involve a wire cutter of some sort to cut it into pieces first. And then we have, you know, metal hook corroding. And if this is in a box and you don't realize that this metal hook is here, 
it can think that everything's all right, but this sort of partially concealed hook in the collar will merely be rusting away under damp circumstances. So contamination, and here we have, oh, it just, you know, the list goes on and on about all the possible sources of contamination. And of course, the extra complication of being around humans and involved in human activity adds a whole other uh, section of uh, contamination, both what's coming off uh, the human body, but also the, the things that we humans do in terms of cleaning or trying to prevent any kind of uh, moth activity and how we store things. And then here we have the rest of, uh, then we have the, the contamination that's literally waterborne where the, the, the dirt and the contaminates are coming, you know, floating in of being absorbed. So contamination in a disaster situation, it's activated because we have higher temperature and humidity, so that rate of reaction increases. And then all those external sources also um, are combining with the internal sources of, of contamination that the, the textile or costume or basics tree already has. And then as the drying and the water removal occurs, tide lines can occur where the contaminants are being concentrated. And of course, with mold and mildew spore, the population explodes in um, disaster situations. Here we have the dyes in a the underarm area of the the dress between the perspiration and the deodorant has completely changed the color of the dyes that were made to color this fabric. Here we have an example of a wooden hanger that was stuffed and padded out with cotton batting and then wrapped with cotton fabric. So it's an acidic wood hanger. It now has mold and mildew activity going on because this is like a sponge holding any moisture in the air. And of course, as we all know, mold and mildew spores are everywhere and are just waiting for their opportunistic environment to have their population explode. So this is sort of hidden away because, of course, this would be inside the costume. Here we have post-disaster, the tide lines. We have the uh, corroding wire. You can just see all the moisture that's been ab absorbed by this cardboard paper backing that is being transferred to the insides, which is a girl-haired embroidery. From a damp wall is where the, most of this moisture came from, is post-firefighting. And then here's sort of an example of what I call, um, you know, seemed a good idea at the time as part of an inexpensive display technique. Uh, is decorative, quote unquote, decorative rocks were used to cover the base of the exhibit case. Uh, well, they got it at the garden store and they didn't rinse the rocks off before they inserted them into the case. So here we have all this dust and dirt and who knows what kind of insect carcasses, etc. Another example of seemed a good idea at the time from the past is the use of blue colored tissue paper because in a disaster and in water excess excess water the blue dye runs and bleeds. So here's some recommendations to help. So of course I've mentioned my favorite ounce of prevention is pound of cure and so we have to combine the reality of the objects in your care combined with 
the reality of your building and the reality of your staffing. And you can only do as much as you can do. So my suggestion is to prioritize your collection as to importance. And of course, loans are number one. If you have loans of anybody else's, any other institutions in your building, um, that it's got to be your number one priority. And then do you have pil what I call pilgrimage objects? What do people come to see in your institution? What's historically important for your mission? And it literally could be something that says, uh, I was going to say, I, you know, an inkwell, a quilt, a piano. It's just so interesting, the, the kinds of things that are historically important for your mission. And then, um, then we have your high dollar value. Uh, and the, the good news, bad news about textiles and costume is that there aren't a lot of high dollar value uh, appraisals. Uh, there are, of course, niches for that, things like Baltimore album quilts, um, pile rugs and carpets, American Southwest weavings, haute couture, girlhood embroideries, and contemporary fiber art. Also, ethnographic and tribal uh, is also very important. And then, of course, those made from natural and man-made fibers and mixed media. And you can just sort of see that all of a sudden your prioritization starts, project gets bigger and bigger. You can also prioritize your collection for salvage difficulty. What would be the hardest thing to get out of your building if a tree fell on the roof and damaged that particular area of your storage? Do you have frame textiles? Are they girlhood embroideries in their original frames? Are they oversized? Are they, you know, 10 foot by 12 foot quilts or contemporary fiber? Um, an upholstered furniture set that came around the Cape of Good Hope uh, and is historically important to your mission. And you can see some of the other. You have crowded storage boxes that, that are paper based, made out of cardboard, and where tissue has been used. Uh, inside to pad things out or separate. And the tissue is paper tissue. You also need to look at where and how things are stored in your museum and prioritize the things that are stored below ground and space where utility pipes run, whether it's water, waste, gutters, downspout downspots. I can't even say it. Downspouts. There we go. Nothing should be stored flat on the floor. They should be elevated at least six inches off the floor. They give you a little bit of uh, space if it's just an overflowing toilet upstairs um, that you can that won't immediately affect. Also it gives you access in terms of for pest management and for cleaning. So here are some of my re recommendations for uh, dealing with things that have to be stored below ground or in a space where utility pipes run. So here's a, an example of, this is a textile storage box. 40 by 18 by 6 that filled with water at a county museum in my region uh, due to one of the condensation lines for their HVAC system being blocked over a three-day weekend. That always happens over a three-day weekend, right? And it liter they're literally pouring the water into a bucket here. It was completely filled to the top. In hindsight, of course, they should have first draped plastic sheeting over their costume rack here so the water wouldn't splash onto the, the, the fabric dust cover here. But hindsight's always 2020, and experience uh, definitely helps. I'm a real fan of having each costume in its own shroud. And here's a, an ex one way of having a costume shroud for each textile, for each costume on a hanger 
without having to do any kind of sewing. If you're not blessed with uh, volunteers who know their way around a sewing or surging machine. You also, um, in terms of recommendations, if you could get a barrier between your warring media. And so a good example of this is if you have metal buttons um, on anything <laughs> other than in, on a piece of cardboard stored separately, getting a piece of aluminum foil or Tyvek under the buttons or the insignia. So in high humidity, wet conditions, the corrosion and rusting of those buttons and or metal insignia won't stain and interact with the, the fabric ground. Ideally, each artifact is labeled with a water-resistant hang tag label with an undyed string or thread that is visible with minimal handling. I'm not a fan of having um, costume pieces labeled inside the center back neck or the inside inside anything and all, or in a situation of large textiles like tapestries or quilts only having one label. Uh, my recommendation is that you have a label on a thread that extends beyond the edge of the costume. Um, that the big ones are labeled in more than one place, opposite ends and also on the outside wrapping, and that you actually have a written labeling policy that is um, taught and maintained. I recommend that you line first each storage box with a piece of fabric so it can be used as a sling. If this box becomes waterlogged, uh, you're going to need at least two people to lift this sling out just due to the weight of the combined water contamination and the costume piece itself. And I also recommend you use fabric as the inner lining to separate objects from each other in a storage box. I am not a fan of using paper tags or acid-free or buffered or unbuffered tissue, any kind of paper tissue, because in disaster situations this uh, turns to, the tissue turns to paper pulp. And the article uh, in down below in the references uh, about tips and tricks uh, also reiterates this. She has a couple of really horrifying images of uh, tissue bits that she had to pick off the costume and textile collection post flood and mud. Um, that was much, a lot of work that had to be done that wouldn't have had to be done if fabric had been used instead. The other uh, foible about um, acid uh, boxes, cardboard-based boxes and tissues is, of course, it too becomes contaminated with the inherent vice problems of themselves and the costume and the textiles, and they actually do need to be replaced and thrown away periodically. So here are just some images of some of the means of moving things safely, slings and how to label things, how to carry things. And you can see that in a situation it's be so much faster to be able to identify which costume pieces are being put into that box for freezing because here are the numbers right there in plain sight. You don't have to be groping around the back of the hanger looking for the number. And here's it as, uh, there we go, uh, you know, on a piece of flat textile with the, the label and then the doll. I've already mentioned the use of fabric to separate the layers if folds are needed, but you can also use it for stuffing out the components uh, of shoes, 3D sleeves, bodices. If you have something that's particularly um, a little weighty, uh, which is three quarters of the costume just because of um, is that uh, 
you can take aluminum foil and crumple it to the shape and size you need and then wrap it with fabric and you use that as a core for your 3D components or for padding out seams. The aluminum foil doesn't absorb any moisture, is very durable, doesn't, since you've already crumpled it, it won't compress anymore. I also recommend a fabric wrap as the outer wrap for rolled textiles and framed um, textiles and then covering with polyethylene sheeting or lay flat tubing and that you tape the seams completely. This is really a very good idea when you have to have storage in um, below ground in the basement. And if you do have rolled textiles, make sure that you have them um, stored where the opening is facing down and not up and that way it doesn't attract dust and collect dust and also um, slows down uh, the amount of water that is uh, can get through when you've got it facing up. If you have a custom made hanger shroud or outside cover also label it in the that way when you have the have to rematch things up you already know which uh, which shroud, which cover needs to go with which which textile or costume. I've already mentioned that uh, ideally that there would be an individual shroud for each hanging costume, even if it was um, being star stored in an appropriate metal storage. And of course that shroud should be uh, labeled also. The other nice thing about having individual shrouds is that it also helps you monitor for insect activity in the storage cabinet because any kind of frass or insect parts will be kept inside that shroud and you'll know that it's that particular uniform jacket that's got problems. Also it's uh, great for capturing the components that are falling off whether it's sequins or buttons or if it's even just this fracturing silk fiber that's continuing to fall off uh, the, um, the, the wedding dress. I'm a real fan of having water alarms uh, in all spaces that could be uh, uh, flooded or have any impact. The good news is, is that there is a wide variety of possibilities including ones that are actually uh, attached to water, the water pipe itself, and it can tell from a flow that it's the water is going out too fast and it will automatically um, shut it off. Of course, this is a much more expensive solution because you actually have to, a plumber um, um, put it in. You have systems that with their water systems, you can actually program them to call your cell phone and a variety of cell numbers available depending on how complicated you get. Um, I've actually seen some of the uh, more sophisticated um, HVAC systems um, are also can have these water sensors added to them and then if it, they detect um, water or moisture um, it will trigger the, the major facilities manager uh, operations folks attention. Uh, here's another one that is also Wi-Fi sends to a cell phone. Then we get to the the real simple one here which is literally it uh, blasts a very shrill high uh, DB level shrill sound. Of course you have to have somebody hear that sound for it to be effective but in terms of um, the kinds of uh, you know, this, this little guy is like less than $20 and then it goes up from there. So some of your homework, as if you didn't have enough to do. Um, I recommend that you reach out to your first responders and have them visit your, your facility, all shifts, even the midnight shift, periodically and to point out where your high priority artifacts and loans are located. Uh, last year at the University of Vermont Special Collections they had a fire and because the first responders, the firemen, fire fighters knew where the collection, the important parts of the collection were, they were able to tarp those storage um, 
drawers and containers before they actually turned the high wa pressure water uh, hoses on and so was able to prevent a lot of uh, water damage and physical damage because they knew where it was, where they were. And reach out to conservators specific to your collection types and get their 24-7 contact information onto your into your disaster response plan. If you don't have any paintings, obviously you're not going to need a paintings conservator, but do you have books? And you should have a book conservator. If you have a textile cons textiles, you need a textile conservator, uh, ex furniture, etc. And then you also are your is to gather your supplies. You need to protect and salvage your high priority artifacts and store them where you're needed. Also determine ahead of time where your oversized textiles could be laid out or brought to if they needed. Can you buy or borrow tents or canopies? Is there a large inside open, you know, where are those large inside? Where's the closest high school gym? Uh, how, how would you get things there? And then when you're doing your tabletop drills and training to brainstorm using a particular type of textile or in a disaster scenario. You have four, 12 hours to protect your four tapestries away from the windows and protect against water intrusion. How would we do that? How do we get artifacts out of our old wooden display case when the wood doors are swollen shut with water? Here's an example. You know, the wood doors in the back. wood swells. Now let's not forget, we need to protect you and everybody else. So you need at least N95s or N100s. These are the disposable ones. The better pr breathing protection was to get fit tested ahead of time for half face respirator. And once again, with it being stored with its cartridges in a plastic bag, you wear nitrile gloves at all times. Uh, wear them under your work gloves during the initial salvage. You do not reuse your nitrile gloves. You just throw them away. You should have goggles that strap onto your head, size to fit over your glasses. And goggles are the ones where they have a top and a bottom and sides. So they literally are the word in case doesn't sound quite right, but basically all your, your, your glasses and your eyes need to be in these goggles to protect them. Also, um, polyethylene knee pads with Velcro straps are available at the paint department and the hardware store so you can protect your knees. And then I'm very fond of using battery powered headlamps for light because this will um, leave your hands free um, for what you need to do. Once again, the co some of these things are going to be disposable. We're not going to try to save them. You've got other better things to do with your time. So cotton bar rags are great for wiping off table, work table surfaces when they're damp and wet. And then you just throw them away. And then once the table surfaces are dry, you can use the disposable static wipes things they're called swiffers or what's the other grabbits, pledge grabbits, and you throw those away in between. And remember that waterlogged textiles and boxes are very heavy. So using uh, protecting your back, having more than one person lifting and carrying, use of carts, use polyethylene sheeting for dragging. Uh, don't need to pick something up if you've you can wiggle polyethylene sheeting underneath it and you can literally use it as a sled. And then of course there's the slipping possibility, slipping hazards in wet and damp situations and that you probably need to wear steel toe footwear um, for the re-entry team in the first round of salvage to protect your feet. So actually getting down to some salvage tips here really do read Gail Ninema's article. It was just amazing how much work they went through on uh, really hand, hands-on kind of an experience. 
And I'm sure that you all have also, because of your location there in Texas, have had experience uh, with some salvage ships. And I would love to have you share those if, you, if you're willing. So I've already mentioned the use of a piece of polyethylene sheeting or bags. And you can gently wriggle under the whole stack of wet out textiles and then between the stacked wet out textiles to separate them. And then you can then use those sheeting and bags as a means to carry them to wherever they need to be carried. You can gently wiggle the pieces of polyethylene sheeting or bags into the arms and hats and betweens front and back to separate for shaping and rinsing and air drying. And if you do use bags, you can then stuff out, stuff them out more to 3D by opening up the bag gently and stuff, putting the stuffing materials inside the bag. Rinsing the outside with clean running water with the nozzle controlled, of course, or inside a space set up to deal with large quantities of water. You literally are using gallons and gallons for a lot of rinsing. And so setting up in a space that has carpets or uh, doesn't have good air circulation is going to make your job very difficult because you're just not going to get the air circulation and the drying that you need. You can use fabric for the initial blotting, flat bed sheets and covering while air drying and, and wicking the contaminants out of the, out of the wet fabrics. Um, I'm a fan of using pee pads for wicking. I've got a picture of a box the next slide you can see inserted into the edges of upholstery and this will help they're very inexpensive and it helps uh, wick away the uh, the dampness in between two wedges uh, of, of upholstered fabric be aware that um, polyethylene hangers can fail if the costume is waterlogged it's too much weight for the hook so you have to keep an eye out for that if you have uh, frame textiles uh, you need to unframe them if they're damp or wet so you can air dry the different components. And air circulation is critical in slowing down the mold and mildew growth. That we want to drop those high relative humidity levels. And so fans should be directed around but not pointed directly at the textiles. Unfortunately, once the mold and mildew population is visible to your naked eye, it probably won't be possible to remove the staining um, that this is uh, this mold and mildew activity. It's a combination of <clears throat> literally the, the number of mold and mildew fruiting bodies, which are colored, and the mold and mildew are digesting and uh, doing their thing, uh, eating the, the the surface they're on and then of course what goes in also has to come out so that they're also being excreted on. And then learn some of the safe turning over techniques uh, when you're handling textiles and costume. So here's a this is what I'm talking about in terms of the pee pads and as you can see they're very inexpensive and once again once you use them you can cut them down into smaller sizes and then once you use them you can um, then just throw them away. So here's an example of a hook failure under weight, either due to time or in being uh, waterlogged. You can just see it's just a soft creep of the plastic um, will literally cause that hook to fail and they'll, they'll come off the rod. So here's some other ideas for um, archival non-absorbent hangers. So this one's really easy to do. Here's some techniques for turning things over. And it literally, this one, this one down here at the bottom, number two, works so fantastically. Obviously, if, you, if the scale is, this is a 10-foot tube, you obviously are going to need two or three people. But the same basic technique works beautifully. So some salvage tips, if their suit is present, you really do need to consult a conservator immediately for possible removal methods. It's just not possible to do. And the same with odors. It's just there's a, a, the 
complications of what was involved in terms of and the types of materials that burn to create the soot or to create the odors is literally a, uh, a particular question that you need to present to a conservator. So in terms of supplies, uh, I've got uh, in the files underneath two lists of supplies. I'm a real fan, obviously, of using fabric. And you can actually use um, fabric that's up to 50% polyester uh, and the rest of it cotton, flat sheets of all sizes. Um, if you are storing your costume collection, your textile collection in a space that does not have the relative humidity well contained, uh, use 50% polyester fiber content flat sheets as your interleaving, as your sling, as your stuffer, uh, because they will not absorb as much moisture as 100% cotton fabric. The other thing that's wonderful about using fabric is that you can reuse it. All you need to do is rinse it in the washing machine, no soap or water, uh, soap or water, soap in the water, no soap in, or detergent in the water, just hot, hot water, and then air dry it if you happen to use um, the anti-static sheets in your dryer. If you don't use anti-static sheets, then you can use your dryer. So other supplies I recommend you get are the polyethylene top folding tables, and they now make them with adjustable heights, so you don't have to hunch over uh, a table that's met, set up for sitting. You can actually raise it up so for standing height, and here are just two brand names. Uh, two mil, four mil polyethylene sheeting or lay flat tubing, uh, a wet dry HEPA vacuum cleaner. I have a show you a picture of the Festool brand is one of my favorites, and then the um, uh, and then a retracting tape measure, uh, battery operated LED task lights. Ought is also color balanced, and then the replacement batteries for that. Uh, write in rain products for your waterproof papers and notebooks. This is especially very helpful where you're doing the initial assessment and inventorying of this as you're doing the first run. And then the Tyvek paper like and fabric like materials. So here's what um, here's my current favorite vacuum cleaner or the Festool. Um, they actually call them dust extractors. They're specifically. Um, the, the market is specifically for uh, contractors, general contractors. Uh, the last time I checked the price, uh, I have a mini, and it was about $400. And then, of course, it's not just the vacuum cleaner, but you also have to get the replacement bags and filters. And when you're dealing with uh, disaster response and salvage, I suggest you also get an, an, another hose as well. Um, and this is a very lightweight, fabulous little vacuum cleaner. And they also get very, very large as well. Uh, Mealy is another one that's, its uh, market is more the consumer or household kind of things. Um, it's one of these things where you have to make sure that you look like, you look for one that is, uh, you know, ha actual HEPA filtered, they get sort of sneaky in their semantics that the HEPA like, uh, et cetera. But make sure you get um, a, a HEPA, a true HEPA mealy. And then here is uh, a source for the 120 inch retractable tape measure. Uh, I buy these like by the dozens. They're just so handy to have, especially uh, because they have both. Uh, inches and metric, and they tend to disappear. Uh, you know, even though you write, you know, registrar only, curatorial, conservator only, they just tend to walk away because they are so uh, handy being able to have it retractable, and so you don't have, uh, you know, a, a 10 inch, a 10 foot uh, tape measure crawling its way out of your cart. It's just uh, neat and tidy in this way. So that is my presentation for today. And if you uh, need any clarifications, if you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to contact me.
And so do uh, we have any questions, Jeff? I have a couple of questions come in, and I would um, encourage anyone who had other questions that came up over the course of the presentation to go ahead and add those to the chat window. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Nick. That was a great presentation. Um, so we had a couple of questions come in um, several slides back um, when you were going over the uh, hang tags. So Christina wanted to know, or Katrina, sorry, wanted to know um, how the hang tag labels are physically attached to the fabric. Ah, yes. Uh, they are literally attached with a needle. So uh, my favorite string to attach a uh, Tyvek tag um, is a piece of embroidery floss. And it comes as six strands. And I always get white. And you just make a little thread tack or thread loop and use take a stitch uh, in the appropriate place and just then knot it. And so if it's, you can strand the six strands down to a single strand or two, two strands. And you can then just judge, cut off how much you need for that loop to, to have the, the hang tag on it. Great. Yeah, and then um, a follow-up that just came in about that uh, from Fran was, how do you number them? Oh, uh, with, with the accession number, or are they talking about the, the pen or pencil? Oh, basically, I use Tyvek, and I use a, either a, a Pigma, Pigma brand, Micron, yeah, it, it's Pigma brand. I'm trying to think of, um, yes, it is with the accession I can't, yeah. <laughs> excuse me, accession number. And, oh, and, and do write the number on both sides because it's one of those Murphy laws that when you're looking at the tag, the side that naturally presents itself to you will be the side you didn't write the number on. So that ounce of prevention is to go ahead and write the number on both sides of the tag. And it's, um, I believe it, Pigma Micron pens. And they come in a variety of, of thicknesses. And I always test them as well because they do change the formulations. Great. Yeah. And then um, we had another question come in earlier, but Elizabeth noted that you, you had addressed it. So. Um, OK. Um, I see Steve Pine has uh, a question that he's typing in. Likewise, I would encourage anyone else who had questions, go ahead and add those in the chat window. And um, a, another reminder, too, if you haven't done so already, please go ahead and take a moment to download the files from the file box. Again, just highlight them in blue and then click the Download File box button there. And um, I will make sure that you have those saved to your computer before we wrap today's session. What I can do also, Jess, is um, look at my notes and come up with a specific manufacturer for the, the pen. Oh, great. Yeah, I can share that with the participants as well. Great. Well, I see Steve is still typing, so um, while we're waiting for any other final questions to come in, I will just go ahead and pull the survey link over so I don't forget this week like I did last week. Um, so uh, just a reminder, if you can um, click on the Browse To button here to go to the survey for today's session, uh, it would be really helpful to just take a minute or two to, to say what you found useful about the program today. Okay, so Steve wrote, when soot is deposited on fabrics and then the fabric is wet by sprinklers or a fire hose, how do you suggest we triage and stabilize the fabric? Soot alone is one thing, but we can't vacuum it from a wet fabric. So what do you suggest? It's a great question, Steve. Oh, boy. Steve, I'm going to nail you with the usual conservator's response. It all depends. <laughs> Ideally, if we're talking about a physically strong intact surface, usually what you can do is wrap it carefully with fabric to help absorb um, the, the, the wetness of it. 
while also hopefully absorbing some of the soot. And then this wrapping would be blotting, but it's not like blotting. It's it's just I want it. It's just laid on very gently. You aren't actually pushing on it because, of course, if you add any physical pressure at this state, the soot just gets ground into the fabric and it's impossible to get out. So the um, basically it has to be, the water has to be removed first. So to triage it, basically what you need to do is wrap it in an absorbent, fabric first, flat sheets being my favorite. And ideally, you would be removing and replacing those sheets. Maybe you should, if it's small enough, you could use the pee pads also uh, to, to keep absorbing the water with new dry fabric or pee pads until it is dry and then dealing with um, the soot. Now, that said, if it's a physically strong, stable, ideally it, was, it would be washed clean immediately with fresh, clean, running water, warm, the appropriate detergent for what it is without going through that drying process first. The complication, of course, is that having a situation set up that you can do this kind of cleaning and, and then rinsing and then allowing it to air dry is usually not physically possible in the first stages of a disaster response. Well, great question, Steve. Thank you, and, and great answer, Meg. Yeah, as you said, often it really is dependent on the specific situation, but something that, yeah. Well, I talk about ideal versus reality. The ideal would be to have, oh, you would have a wash station set up waiting for those tapestries to arrive. The, uh, the reality of it, it, oh my gosh, you know, you're still, you know, listening to the, the first responders of the, when they're telling you, no, another, another storm's coming. You have to get out of the building now, you know. Oh, so Jennifer just had a question come in. Um, this is just curious about the water source for um, uh, that you'd be using for cleaning and rinsing in a large scale disaster. They had no water for some time in the Beaumont oh, area. Yes. So could you bring in a tanker with water? What do you suggest? Oh, absolutely. In fact, if you actually go talk to the folks that are carrying food products in tankers, so things like um, I'm here in Sonoma County in Northern California, and we have a large dairy industry. They, their um, milk trucks that they move milk around in has to literally be cleaned out with um, potable water that they then just dump. And so if you can make arrangements ahead of time with somebody outside the region, absolutely bringing in a tanker of potable water will definitely um, be fabulous for, for rinsing in large-scale disasters. Of course, you'd have to also make the arrangements, you know, they're used to using, what, a two or three inch diameter hose, and so you'd have to figure out how you were going to safely get that water out of the tanker and, and a neck down to, you know, a drinking water hose uh, to, to get it to the, so you're, you're not blasting the, the the textiles or costume across the parking lot by the force of the water. Great. Thank you. Did anyone have any other questions? I wasn't seeing anyone typing anything. Um, we've given us a lot to think about, Meg. Thank you so much for this very thorough look at um, how we should be preparing for dealing with textiles affected by disasters. Um, and Great. I'll My move pleasure. the survey link, sorry, so we can there again, but um, thank you for providing that. It's, it's really appreciated if you have follow-up questions. But um, Once again, I encourage you all to please go ahead and fill out the survey link. Uh, Jennifer noted that it wasn't showing up uh, as a link with the original, so I, I put the URL in the box there, and hopefully that helps. Um, I'm grateful to you all for taking the time again to join us for a webinar, and um, next week we'll have yet another session, and that will be our sort of marathon here. But um, 
thanks thanks again for setting aside some time on a Wednesday and of course a big thank you to our presenter Meg for putting together this excellent program and thank you all for helping with heritage response